Okay, so specification of regression variables. We don't usually put everything into the regression, do we? Remember, we picked the dummy variables based on the theory. So specifically uh, related to the topic. I could put, for example, into the trade model population size in the sense that population measures the size of the country as well. Po countries with more population would likely trade with their neighbors because they need more food. Maybe locally produced food is not enough, so they may trade. So I could do that as well. Yes? But wouldn't we then need to exclude GDP? Exactly. So when I put it in there, I might see correlation between GDP and, and population, and this is multicollinearity. So I would have misspecified my regression model. Yeah. So this is the topic about the uh, about uh, it's it uh, today's topic is about the misspecification of the model. So we don't usually plug in everything and say okay it's it's population not GDP. So I'm on, I'm interested in putting both of them. But what do we get then in the end? Morning. What what do we uh, what sort of regression model do we get? What happens if there is a multicollinearity in the regression? Do we get a biased estimate? Do we get inconsistent estimate? Do we get inefficient estimate or anything? Uh, our squared value goes down. Right? Okay, maybe our squared value will go down, but there's more, much more serious problem here. Or the coefficient. Yes, um, the coefficient standard errors will be inefficient. Their sta standard errors will be inflated. Mm -hmm. Their variance will be inflated. That means we will have fewer significant variables. So if you see fewer significant variables in your model, then that might be caused by true, mo maybe this is true, that, that has to be true result, or there must be multicollinearity, because one variable causes the others to correlate with each other, and, or with itself, and it causes the variance to inflate, making t-statistic small. Remember, t-statistic is basically coefficient estimate divided by the standard error. If the standard error is big, if it's inflated, the t will be downward biased, so it will be, uh, sorry, upward biased, I should say. It will be, no, it is small, I'm sorry. It will be small because standard error will be inflated, the t will be smaller, so you will have uh, what you call insignificant variables. And you might think that your model is rubbish and you might want to, you might, you get demotivated. That's the, that's the sort of uh, uh, reaction the students usually have. They think that the mod model is not, is not good enough for them and they will get low marks. No, not necessarily. Maybe the true model is that one. It's just the not sample, uh, the, your sample is not small, uh, is not large enough. So there are many different uh, reasons for not getting the right results. So one of them is basically specification. That's, caused, that's uh, causing the multicollinearity. Yeah? And sometimes I see dissertation students whose samples are huge, but they don't get good enough results. And they, they just worry that their model is not good enough as well. But maybe it's just not getting significant variable doesn't mean you had a wrong model. It simply means, basically, maybe there's no relationship in your sample. Maybe the countries you picked up do not have, the, do not, uh, have that economy of the US where the model works very well, but it may not work with your data, for example. Yeah? So one of the aspects of this sort of problems is, is the uh, specification problem. So let's look at this uh, um, model matrix. On the columns, you have the true models. On the uh, rows, you have the fitted models. So if your model is, say, a uh, true model is, say, the simple regression model, in other words, x determines y, and you estimate it that x indeed determines y using the fitted model, where you, y bar means basically you fitted the right model on the data, then it's the correct specification. Similarly, if y is determined by multiple variables and you fitted the correct multiple variable regression model, that's fine. But what if your model is basically multiple regression model underlying true model, underlying relationship is multiple regression, but you fit it simple, uh, sorry, single, single regression model, which omits the uh, x3 variable. So you fit it uh, only x2 
assuming that X3 is redundant, so it, it didn't include it. Then you have incorrect specification, and as such, your coefficient estimates are biased. It could be greater value than what the true beta is, or lower than that. It, bias could be both ways, could be negative or positive bias. I'll show you what, what causes the bias. And your standard errors are not valid, so you don't use them. You shouldn't use them. This is a standard case of um, a norm, a general. It, it happens in general, may not be specific to your model. Sometimes this works. Even if you skip some important variable, you get the valid standard errors and unbiased results. But in general, in many cases, you will face this sort of un, uh, omitted variable bias on the included regression so, so the bias will be on this let me show you where is it okay so by this beta 2 will then be biased not not it will not be its expected value will not be beta 2 here so the expected value of beta 2 hat will not be equal to beta 2 it will be some it will have some bias because of beta 3 being absorbed into beta 2 in this model when you exclude x3 from the model now second case where you could include multiple regression model in your analysis when the true regression model is just simple one so you just do extra effort here do by including this but this doesn't invalidate uh, sorry um, it doesn't impose any bias on your estimates so the beta 2 will not be biased it will it could be larger or smaller but by not a huge amount. The mar it, it will be marginally different, but it won't be true, true estimate. And standard errors will also be valid in general, although they will be inefficient in the sense that they will be a bit larger. Yeah, but these ones will be completely different. Right, so we will look at the one here. Uh, first, we will start with the true model being the multiple regression, but we will uh, we'll estimate the simple regression model to, and what happens. Now, here's mathematical expression to what we just said, the bias. Here is the true model. Underlying regression model is that y is determined by x2 and x3. But I estimated this. I include, excluded the x3. Which means then expected value in this model of beta 2 hat is then equal to true beta 2 plus highlighted area here, whatever expression here is. This is basically the product of beta 3 from the true model and some correlation. This one is more like a measure of correlation without the, uh, the uh, in the denominators, we should usually have x3 as well here, but it's not there. Usually it will be, you remember the correlation coefficient formula. This would be the, this numerator is fine, it's divided by square root of the variance of x2 and times the variance of x three. Here it's just that x3 one is missing. So just a partial, you can see that part of it is basic for instance. But this is OLS estimator. The formula is OLS estimator. Anyway, this is not the main point here. Just to give you intuition, I deviated a bit. But this expression here, oh, my thing is disappearing again. This expression here is measure of correlation between x2 and x3. And beta 3 is basically the uh, coefficient estimate from the, uh, from the true model. So bias is, will be equal to the product of the two. So beta two, sorry, the estimated beta two we obtain from the in, uh, incorrectly specified model will then be biased. So it's like you estimate the gravity model by dropping the distance variable and you estimate it using GDP only. So GDP coefficient will be, since G3, we don't know the correlation between the, uh, between the distance and GDP, but we know that distance affects negatively, right? To trade, affects negatively trade, has a negative impact on trade, which means basically we should have a negative bias. In, in other words, GDP's coefficient estimate will be downward biased. Um, that will be clear to you in a minute. Let me show you graphically what it is. But are you with me up to now? This is not in the exam but it would be good if you use it in an assi assi assignment in some way. This is called specification test usually. At the end of the lecture, you will see what to do for practical purposes. Um, 
So again, this is our original model and we have fitted model and this is the bias estimator. Now, graphically, well, what I have just said is that effect of x2 on y is captured by beta2. <coughs> but because x3 is removed from or omitted from our estimated model here, what we have is that a bias will then combine the effect of x3 on y, which is beta3, plus the mimicking effect of x2 for x3. So basically, x2 performs two functions in this case. x2 has its own effect plus effect that x3 would have if we include it. So partial effect of x3 is now included in x2. As such, this estimator here, sorry, the estimate here will capture its own beta 2, which is this one, then the potential effect of x3, which is beta 3 here, and the highlighted part here, which is the correlation between x2 and x3. Notice what we have here. We don't have the, we, the x3 is missing here, means basically it's absorbed into the u, which is the errors. x3 is inside the errors, which then correlates with x2, which we included and inflates or deflates the beta 2. Now, does this graphical explanation clean? make it clear to you or not? This is redundant. I just included it just in case. But if you get a feel for it with an example, the topic is not difficult. I'll show you an example now. So basically, x2 and x3, if they correlate, the result will be uh, problematic. If they do not correlate, you will see that, let me go back, this thing here highlighted in yellow will be zero. So zero times beta three is basically zero. So expected value of beta two hat will be just beta two. So it depends on the correlation between x2 and x3. Yeah, if you omit the variable and it's not correlated with the included variable, then that's fine. You omitted it correctly because x3 would have been irrelevant if you included. But in many cases, they are correlated, so we will have to be careful. Now, here's an example using uh, schooling data. Um, S stands for number of years an individual has uh, schooling. So it's individual schooling years from first grade to 12th grade in the US or in, in, in Europe, I guess. In UK, it's 12 years. And AV, ASV variable is the measure of uh, cognitive ability of an individual. So I guess this is a score, test score of cognitive ability or combination of scores that proxy the cognitive ability. And SM is the schooling of mother. So individuals' education depends on their ability, cognitive ability, and their mother's education. So the family background, let's say. Do you agree with that? Hypothesis. This is a hypothesis. Economists are hypothesizing and trying to test if this is true. And they do test here. Look, look at the results. Both of them have significant effect. Cognitive ability has 1.36. It's a large effect with a large t stat, so it's quite a good estimate. But mother's education has marginally small effect, but it's significant statistically. So this model, this hypothesis is accepted. We accept the hypothesis, but do you think, you, you personally, do you believe that it's true, that what was your this? education, you, you, you are here because your mother had a degree or something? <laughs> Maybe we should then include societal variables, right? Where you come from. For example, uh, you can add democracy variable. In democracies, institutions function well and people tend to educate themselves more than where the corruption is rampant in which then people don't get education, instead they learn how to steal money, so work in the government agencies and loan the money without education kind of thing, yeah? So maybe we have to include that as well, yeah. How do you know there's significance here? Oh, please answer it yourselves, guys. Who, does, who wants to answer it? Yes, go on. The p-value mm -hmm. is zero. Yeah, you see the p-values here? They're all less than 0 0.001. 
So if it's significant even at the highest level, a smallest level of significance, let's say. Usually you want to have p-values less than 0 0.05 to decide that we have sufficient evidence of statistical significance. Yeah? Uh, yeah, when you put this into an Excel sheet, you will not put zero zero zero. Instead, you put stars. Yeah. So you, based on these t values, you will put a three star on these coefficient estimates. If it's zero point zero one, that will be one three star. If it's less than zero point zero five, that will be two stars. If the p value is greater than zero point zero five but less than zero point ten, then that's one star. If above zero point ten, no stars. So not effect. Not 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 statistically significant effect. Okay. Anyway, there is something. Some saying, I think it's an English saying, I don't know if it is, but it sounds like when you educate a, uh, a male, you educate an individual, but when you educate a woman, you're educating a nation. Because this is where the childcare kicks in. Because they, they are the ones who spend much of the time with the kids, and if the woman smokes in front of kids, kids smoke. If, they, if she shouts, kids start shouting. This is traditional, but not today. Obviously, today women and men work together. Both of them work and kids are in the kindergarten. It's probably not that important. But traditionally, Western culture was like this. Women were at home. Men were out working and earning. But then it's the same depending on if there's more male or hmm? female in kindergarten education. Yeah, it looks like female mostly, isn't it? <laughs> That's true, actually. If you go to kindergarten, you have a lot of females working. That's in fact, true. Few males will probably be doing that. Anyway, but that, that saying holds even today. That's why these guys are hypothesizing it, I, I, I believe. Okay, anyway, so let's see how this uh, results in. Um, in what it, it, what it will result in. For example, uh, by estimating only the... Uh, let me go back. What I wanted to say was that we will now drop the uh, SM in the next regression and see what happens to the coefficient of uh, ASV, which is Cognitive Ability Score. What do you think? Sort of Will it be positive or negative? Be biased? Uh, positive. Positive? Positive? So this is positive because? Because it absorbs <coughs> the positive effect of the mother's education. Yes. So uh, in more specific details, Remember the formula? Formula says the bias will be a product of beta 3 and the correlation between the two. And beta 3, if you remember, was positive. Yeah, SM had a positive effect. Yeah, if I go back, I can show you. There's an SM, 0 0.19. That's positive. And the correlation between the two, to the right, you can see 0 0.35, is positive. The product of the two will be positive. So the bias will then be positive. Yeah. In our paper that we have to write, if we see correlation, we just leave it out or should we put it in but comment on it? Uh, in between the uh, explanatory yeah. variables. Yeah, between like um, the variables we chose, for example. <laughs> oh, that's okay. As long as it's not multicollinear, you can include them. And if you get non-significant variables, mm -hmm. it should, you should better uh, remove them. Not yeah, non and then check if remaining ones are significant. Maybe it will become significant because one collinear variable, even if it's a small correlation, may cause others to become uh, non-significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually data specific. Theory, economic, econometric, and economics theory may not hold in practice. It really is depending on the data, and it's also important that you check the residuals for outliers. If some of the residuals are too high, maybe including another variable will remove that because that's being caused because of the uh, exclusion of the variables, some important variables. Yeah, even if they correlate, you must include them on because then residuals will be a white noise or normally distributed. Even if they are not significant, keep it as it is. It's it's basically uh, a lot of uh, work if you want to get the perfect model. You have a month, so maybe you'll try and do pull out, pull off. Let's so if say. they're not significant, we shouldn't include them? No. What I'm saying is, if 
you, one by one you include variables yeah. and you have five models say and as check each time you add a new variable check what happens to the coefficients of the others if they change dramatically in the next model you delete that variable and add the new one oh, so it's not always an addition no you add them to see what happens to the model and if your r squared grows up usually r squared goes up whatever you add even if you add non-related variable it will go up marginally but if it that in new variable is correlating with others and causing uh, causing non-significance of the variables then it's best to remove it because it's not adding a value so your r squared is not going up by 10 percent so remove it yeah can, can you just keep it and then explain it yeah you can, you can do that as well but then you have to come up with the final model anyway in the end stick to one of them so you have five models and you choose one of them to be model three because it has a high r squared and the significant variables or nothing is better than anything in the estimations so you simply say it may be sampling variation that your your variables are not correlated with the dependent variable significantly so that's the result mm -hmm. possibility many i mean even the econometricians who publish papers don't have don't strike the right balance on the, in the regression model because this is all sample based. We don't know. We don't have these uh, these variables that we'd want to include usually in practice. So, for example, the political stability proxy is a proxy. It's not a variable. We don't know how to measure it, but we just measured it. We we, we trusted World Bank. That's why we downloaded that variable and ran the regression. But we actually don't know if that proxy is the best proxy. We could use economic intelligence units proxy or some other think tanks proxy as well. You, then you get a different variable, right? Uh, different results. So we just took a proxy for this because World Bank is better in estimating it. It has offices in around the world and they can communicate with the people there and then feel for feel what's happening. They will see what's happening and then come up with the measure. Yeah, it's, it's all proxy variables. So and you add variables assuming they will have a significant effect, but they may not. So remove it. Remove them. Yeah. If you have different sources like that and you're not sure which one to trust, shouldn't you do one for each and then just take uh, an average? Yes, you can do that as well, yeah. It's experimentation. In the end, you choose the one that has uh, better R squared and better... R squared is not the R squared usually. You don't trust it 100%. You should also look at the reaction of the coefficient estimates and standard errors when you add the extra variable. And also residual, <coughs> residual uh, heteroscedasticity and others. Because you don't want to have also uh, uh, estimation that that has uh, non-normal variables. No normal variables, uh, non-normal residuals occur when you should have included the right variable or you include the wrong variable. Yeah, so it could be many many causes. There's there's a lot of stuff here to go. With. But once you do it, you will realize that you need to do more. And you keep going and going. There is no end to it. So that's why PhDs are for four years. You do much of the work in the first two years, but then you want to do more and you go on for two another, another two years. That's the case here. Because there's not, by the time you do two years of PhD and come up with a paper, someone else would have published better ones. So then obviously that's another issue here. Anyway, let's go further here. Um, so we estimated the uh, original model here with the uh, True model being a three, uh, sorry, um, multi multiple regression model being this this one here is a multiple regression model. So original result shows us the beta one, sorry in this case beta two hat is one point thirty seven, statistically significant. Now what we did now is we dropped S M. Just to see what happens to the coefficient estimate of S A S V A B C. So this is the regression omitting S M. Notice this. Coefficient estimate now in the absence of SM variable is 1.58. It's statistically significant, but here it's smaller. Do you see the bias here? It's a positive bias, as we said earlier. But the standard error is lower. And standard error is lower, which means it's more efficient. So this means we should stay with the second one? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You should also check the R squared here. It's missing as well. But R squared, as I said, is, is always not the one that you should trust mostly. Usually, the more 
the information you can include in the model, the better it is. Mm -hmm. So if you include addition variables and and the coefficient estimate changes, keep it. At the same time, R squared may change as well, so keep it there. But in this case, we, we, we have to be careful because although we achieved a bit more efficiency here, in other words, the sampling distribution of this beta is has a very smaller variance, mm -hmm. it's it's upward biased. Its effect is being exaggerated. It's as if it says now it, is that individuals' education really depends largely on their cognitive ability. So much more effect is being absorbed here by this one variable. That's why we usually, we start with a simple variable model, which is X and Y. Then you add the next one to see if anything changes. Yeah, we're doing that. It's just I'm coming backwards here. Bottom, this is bottom-up approach. I'm starting with the true model here, being three two variables, and then doing a static analysis by removing this. I'm removing SM and see what happens. Instead of starting with SM, oh sorry, ABC, and then adding SM. Yeah, so I'm going backwards. While the actual process is that you start with the simple model and go by adding extra variables. Yeah? So we should be careful here in terms of treating this. It may be showing us a, a bias because remember, if you don't include the necessary variables, relevant variables, they will be in the U, errors. And errors are correlating X's with X's. When they correlate, the coefficient estimate will be biased upwards or downwards. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if we now delete a SVC and run the regression with SM only, mother's education? You could expect a positive result as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I went forward. So here's the, the same formula here. So now beta 3 hat will be biased upwards 2 because beta 2 was positive plus the correlation between the two variables was positive their product will be positive value so we add and now notice that this is a huge value almost not almost but it's a huge improvement increase I should say not improvement you see originally with the control variable cognitive ability our main variable SM had a coefficient estimate of 0 0.19 but now its impact is inflated, it's, it's exaggerated by excluding cognitive ability. So this is because SM's coefficient is now capturing the effect of ASVABC as well. So it's trying to mimic the effect of cognitive ability. So mother's education is trying to absorb some of the effects of the uh, cognitive ability. That's why it's exaggerated, huge coefficient estimate. So this is economically large effect. One year increase in mother's, uh, one additional year increase in mother's education basically increases the child's education by 0 0.35 years. So if you have a mother, let's say if someone has a mother with a 10 years education, they would have some X amount of it, uh, their child would have X amount of years of education, but 11 years of mothers with 11 years of education will have children whose, whose education will be 35, you know, 0 0.35 years more. That's the, this, that's the idea here. There's a huge impact of mother having on the ch children's education. So this is an inflated result. There may be some push by mothers to, to, to get their children to study longer and come out well in the end, but that effect is too high. And also we could question, well, how about adding more variables, for example, yeah? Just, this model may not be true in itself. It's just an example now. Anyway, so that's what economists are hypothesizing right now, that maybe parental education rather than mothers. So we let father's education at some point onto this one as well, and then see what happens later in the, in the day. Um, so, so coefficient has doubled, nearly doubled. So we shouldn't take it at face value and then do a bit of more tests. So for example, with this regression, I could do a residual test and see if there's an outlier. 
If there is, obviously, there must be because I'm missing huge number, amount of information here. So there must be some heteroscedastic residual or some outlier, basically, that causes the variance of the residuals to explode. Then I will include the variables and test whether that uh, has been removed. So maybe you want to do it tonight. Uh, regressions, do one by one, test, you've done the hysteroscedastics already, some of you, and test for residual normality as well by plotting the residuals in a histogram. If some of the bars are taller than the others and not normally distributed residuals implies you're missing uh, variables that needs to be included. That needs to, need, need to be included. Okay, how about the R squared then? We usually tend to see uh, exploding R squared as we add more variables. Um, notice this, we have to be careful again. When we run the regression with both the variables x1 and x2, this is our R squared, 29%. Without SM and with just A, S, B, A, B, C, what happens is R squared is it's not bad, isn't it? 0 0.26. Don't we look at the adjusted R squared? We should usually, but uh, it will not be different because whether you look at adjusted R squared to get at the same time, it will give you the same result because it's consistent. We are measuring, uh, we, we have the same, what, S? As the dependent variable, yeah, you can you can have a look at that, just R squared if, if you want, yeah. But when you report, put the just R squared in the in the regression model. You need to, in fact, look at adjusted actually when you have a multiple regression. But here, this is single regression, so we only look at adjusted. Uh, sorry, simple uh, R squared, but that will be the same in any case, in many instances. So you can see that R squared is higher. With single regression is also high, with SM is it not is not bad twelve percent. But when you add this together twenty six and twelve, this would be uh, what twenty, almost twenty nine. Sorry, almost thirty. Thirty eight. Yeah. It is so individually, they are adding huge amount of contributing huge amount of variation into the S, but when you put all together into SM, into this original model, it's not forty percent but twenty nine. That's because individually, R squared are inflated. Remember we said that X's are capturing the missing variables effects and that also affects R squared and it also explodes. That also explodes R squared as well in each case. Yeah. So having and looking at R squared is not useful as well when you have single regressions as a, as a result. In multiple regressions, yes, it's best to look at R squared when you're comparing the models. Does that make sense to you guys? How misspecification makes our analysis so invalid. Yeah, we will falsely then claim in the end that we have a better model. In fact, these significant variables do not necessarily mean the model is better. Now, how about negative, negative effects, negative coefficient? Uh, what you call this? Negative bias. That's also possible. There could be negative bias as well, just like we had positive bias. But this time, the bias will be again driven by, I'm going to skip this, driven by the correlation between X and Y. Notice this. Oh, let's go back. This is a different regression model. Notice that. This is log earnings, log weekly earnings, equals to schooling and experience. So basically, an individual's earnings, the, their wages, depend on their schooling, how long they've been educated for, and also their experience after leaving school. So you can expect that people with more experience will get better paid jobs. And the same, the same people will maybe, maybe have longer uh, schooling years. Yeah, or not necessarily the same, but people with schooling, longer schooling years may, may also have high earnings. Um, that holds in general, not specific cases. I saw people who with PhDs doing admin jobs as well. I think I told you about this, the IT guy. Uh, so not necessarily, it really depends on choices. This, we have choices and he decided to go for IT while having a PhD in biomedicine. <laughs> so he's, he's was, he, he had this 
Swiss food at the time, but they decided to leave it for some reason. But yeah, medis <laughs> medicals are earning a lot these days. Moving on. Why are you laughing? <laughs> you know, in the UK, one of the shortage skills is medical sciences, people with medical degrees. And he had it for some reason, he decided to leave. And he could have been working for drug development companies and earning hundreds of thousands for doing research for our research and development personnel, for example. These are scientists. But when he says in 1996 there was boom in IT industry, computers started becoming more cheaper and he bought one and he ended up being a computer specialist and now he's an IT uh, director. Okay, anyway, choice. Now, as we said earlier, the, uh, the expected value of the coefficient beta 2, so it's the beta 2 is the one that we included, is the coefficient of the variable that we included. Beta 3 is the one we usually drop or include. So expected value of the coefficient estimate for the included variable is then the true beta 2 plus beta 3 times the correlation between the two variables, S and experience. Experience is basically number of years of work after leaving school, and S is the number of years a person is in the school. And it turns out they have a negative correlation. What does that mean, guys? More schooling. So more schooling means less experience? Possibly, people who drop out will start working early. Mm -hmm. I don't know among, I mean, this is certainly not among investment bankers. This survey is not done among investment bankers. Their schooling years are quite long and their experience could be quite long as well. This is probably among the low paid people, uh, low paid job, jobs probably. In any case, it turns out that in this sample, experience has a negative correlation with schooling. So this must be people who, <coughs> some are, some spend more time in schooling and less experience and some dropped out and worked just like, who is the guy's name? Lord Alan Sugar? He's a dropout, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And he made millions when he was a young guy. And he, he's lucky actually. He, he, he invested in uh, IT, computer business, and that made him money in the 90s. He was the one who brought in computers in the UK, one of the few who started business and selling computers, commercializing the computers, PCs, in the 90s, and went on diverse. Investing more. Anyway, um, this was a choice. So, what do we now have? Let's look at the uh, practical aspect of this now, rather than looking at the theoretical side. So, notice this highlighted uh, results. S and experience. This is the original model, true model, multiple model. They are statistically significant. They are T values are quite high, greater than 1.96. Now, when we dropped experience, our coefficient estimate for S is 0 0.06, downward bias now. Yeah, that's because of correlation. Correlation is stronger, has a stronger effect than the positive effect of beta 3 here. So the coefficient estimate is about 3.3 units lower than the original 0 0.09 here. Yeah, originally this is the coefficient estimate we have, but when we drop the experience, that's what we have. And next, when we dropped S and regressed experience on log earnings, we are even get a negative value. This is nonsense, yeah? It tells us that the more experience you have, less earnings you will have. Less you earn, basically which is nonsense, right? That's because, again, we are omitting important variable, which is schooling. So if you get something like this, counterintuitive results, then immediately you should be thinking, okay, I must have missed something else. That thing is in my errors, you, and that's correlating with my X, and that's causing downward bias. So the bias was so much that the positive coefficient that we have in the original is actually turning into negative. So the bias is too high. In other words, if I go back to the formula, 
You see this? The beta 2 is positive, but times it by negative correlation, which is this value, or is something like this. This whole thing becomes greater, greater than the original, which makes it a hugely negative value, and the positive will be consumed, will be removed completely. The effect of the actual beta 3 is actually smaller than, than what we have on this side here. So in the end, expected value will become a negative value. Here it is. And look, look at dark squared. The sum of the two is smaller this time. Earlier in the original example, the sum of the individual R squared was higher than the multiple regression R squared. This is because, again, downward bias deflates R squared as well, just like it did the coefficient estimates. Make sense, guys? It's a bit long, but if you have questions, ask. You can have a quick break if you want. Yeah, quick break then. Let's have a very quick break because I, I see you guys losing interest in this.